all stand.
You know, as we sing that song, we are reminded of the promise, Lord, that you gave to your disciples, and it flows all the way down to us almost 2,000 years later. The promise, Lord, that our hearts don't need to be troubled. There in John chapter 14. Because you said you're going away to prepare a place for us. And when it's done, you're going to come back and receive us unto yourself that where you are, we might be also. And then you say, because in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. You know, today we're honoring Father's Day. But Lord, we want to honor you because you are our Father. And one day we're going to go and be with you, Lord, in your house. We're going home. And so, Lord, just with that thought in mind, as we begin the service this morning, we would ask that the Holy Spirit would make Jesus Christ ever so real, our Savior, our Redeemer, our soon-coming King, our prophet and priest. And so, Lord, we just pray this morning, Father, that we honor you as we honor your Son and as we allow the Holy Spirit to have full reign and full work this morning in the service. And so, Lord, just help us to strip away all of the distractions, you know, of what happened last week, what's going to happen next week, and just for the next little while, just to focus on you and our praise and in our worship and our study of your word. And then, Lord, having communion as we honor you this morning. We lift these things to you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's kids would say, Amen. Hey, let's remain standing. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
seated. Sitting here in your presence, in a grace so relentless, I am one by perfect love, wrapped within the arms of heaven, in a peace that lasts forever, sinking
So I'll stand. You stood before creation, eternity in your hands. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now. find that that's exactly what you're looking for. You know, as we come through the first four books of the Old Testament, we find a lot of legislation, a lot of legalism, a lot of rules. It's not until we arrive at the book of Deuteronomy that we get the motivation behind it, where you tell us that you didn't choose us because we're the fastest or the smartest or the wisest. You chose us because you love us. That's the motive. And then when we come to chapter 10, we have into chapter 11, the Shema. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And Jesus tells us the same thing. We're going to get to it in a few weeks in Matthew's gospel. Father, you're after the heart of men. You're after the heart of women. What you want is our heart. That we, would be, that we would be passionate in our service toward you, Father. And so this morning, we would just ask that your Holy Spirit would wash over our hearts. And our hearts tend to be hard, Lord. And they tend not to be a fruitful place. And we need that work of your Spirit constantly, Father. 
just making Jesus ever so real to us and filling our hearts with gratitude and thankfulness for what you have done. I say that because today again we're taking communion. And Lord, you said as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are to remember some things. First and foremost, that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten Son to suffer and die that we might be redeemed and saved then to remind us that there's forgiveness in the blood of Christ and in the broken body of our Savior. There's forgiveness. And thirdly, Lord, that as we eat from that bread, we become one with you and one with each other. So there's unity. There's love and there's forgiveness and there's oneness. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning. Lord, we lift our needs before you and there are plenty, no doubt. Every need represented here this morning, whether it be physical, financial, whether it be emotional or spiritual, whether it be relational, marriage, your family, or whatever, Lord. We lift those needs to you this morning, and we pray for the many of our fellowship that aren't here this morning because they're away visiting family on Father's Day. We pray they'd have a blessed time, and they truly would honor their fathers who worked so hard to take care of them for so many years, Lord, that it would be a blessed day. But Father, above anything else, we're here this morning to honor you as our Father, our eternal Father, our heavenly Father. And Lord, I thank you that I can call you that this morning because you redeemed me, you saved me. And what a privilege it is this morning that we can look heavenward and we can say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, Father, give us this day our daily bread. You know what we have need of. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those that have debts against us. Help us to have pure and clean hearts, hearts of forgiveness. Lead us not into temptation. And Lord, there's a lot of that going on today. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We'll spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle into your spot this morning.
Busy morning, isn't it? Hey, continue to pray for those that are out of town and traveling, visiting parents on Father's Day. Um, so we're going to do this this morning. If you're a father, we want to honor you this morning. Please stand. All fathers. All right. All right. Micah, you, uh, well, let's remain standing. You can stand up too, Micah. You got one in the oven. <laughs> Jeff, you, you're a father. It's just a matter of time. Very short time for you. <laughs> Hey, listen, we want to honor you this morning because of all of your hard work and that you've taken on the responsibility of a wife and a family and uh, you haven't shirked that duty, so we want to appreciate you. Amen? Now, if you are a grandfather, remain standing. Wow. I'm still standing too. Okay, this is where I'm going to sit down. If you're a great-grandfather. Four guys standing, four guys standing. Okay, here's where it's going to get telling about your age. If you're a great-great-grandfather, go ahead and... What? Frank, you're the prize winner, all right. Well, God bless you. I pray that they would take you to lunch or whatever. You deserve it. Um, absolutely. Hey, I've got just a couple of announcements. Um, for your parents whose teenagers are going to youth camp this next weekend, you are to deposit your kids, yeah, here at the church, Friday morning, the 23rd, at 7.15 a.m., now, I know that you'll get up early to get rid of your kids, your teenagers anyway, for a few, few days. So make sure that, uh, I don't know when you're supposed to pick them up. Uh, Pastor Tim didn't tell me. Pastor Aaron, when they're supposed to be picked up? Okay, they'll call you. <laughs> if, if they bring them back, you can pick them up here, here at the church. But that, that will be on Sunday after, afternoon. To, Tuesday afternoon. Don't be here on Sunday to pick them. Tuesday afternoon, okay. So, and just be praying, please, that the Holy Spirit would get a hold of their hearts and just, again, prepare them to face this world that is so corrupt. Amen? And then don't forget that VBS is coming up in July. You can get uh, information in the bulletin. You can see, there's a lot of people out here. You can see uh, Chris Enns, or you can see my wife, or Karis about that. So make sure you sign your kids up for uh, VBS. And I think that is the only announcements that we have. Hey, let's turn on our Bibles again this morning to Matthew's Gospel. Uh, we have come as far as chapter 20, verse 17, and that's where we're going to pick up this morning. Very interesting study before us as Jesus' focus now turns from his teaching ministry uh, to the sacrifice that he's about to make uh, for the sins of the world. So as you're turning to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, put your finger on verse 17, and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it's inerrant, it's inspired, it's authoritative. Uh, we thank you, Father, that you have put to pen and paper under the direction and unction of the Holy Spirit the things that you need for us to know about you, about your nature, your character, your promises, about the work of Christ and salvation, about the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. And so, Lord, as we look at these next few verses, as we move through the rest of chapter 20 this morning, and we finish it up, hopefully, we pray that the things that are before us this morning, that, Father, you, as we study them, as your Holy Spirit plants them deep into our hearts, that you give permanency to those things, Father. We don't want to be just hearers of your word. We want to be doers because we understand, Father, that the benefit is not in the instruction, it's in the application. And so some things we need to apply to our lives today from your word. And, and God, we'd ask again, just speak to us, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And all God's kids would say, amen. As we come now to chapter 20, verse 17, there's a change that is going on. And you could read glibly through it and not completely understand all that is happening. 
But Jesus now is leaving the area of the Galilee where he spent most of his ministry. I love that the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, spend most of their time giving us insight and understanding of what Jesus taught in his ministry around the area of the Galilee. When you study John's Gospel, it's set aside a little differently in that it spends most of its time telling us about the ministry of Jesus around Jerusalem and the holy city, Judea, and, and in those areas. But this will be the last time uh, that Jesus will have to make that trek from the area of the Galilee to Jerusalem because now he is determined. He is setting his face like a flint toward the crucifixion. And so we read there in verse 17, and Jesus going up to Jerusalem. Notice carefully, every time you travel to Jerusalem, you're going up. Because spiritually, you're going up. It's the city of God. Geographically, they're going down. They're going south. But Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way and he said unto them, he's going to instruct them. We, we're going to find in Luke's gospel chapter 18 verse 34 that they didn't understand. In fact it says this um, in Luke's gospel chapter 18 verse 34, and they understood none of the things and these sayings were hid from them. Neither knew they the things which he was, was speaking of. Luke gives us that insight, Dr. Luke, that as Jesus now is going to take them aside and begin to instruct them more fully of why he has come and the, the thing that he's going to accomplish is he's going to, <coughs> excuse me, to Jerusalem for the last and final time. He's setting his face like a flint toward the crucifixion. He will suffer and die for the sins of the world. And so as they're taking that eastern route along the eastern side of the Jordan, beautiful route as you travel down, they'll come down to the area of Jericho and they'll cross over the same place, no doubt, where the nation of Israel crossed over many, many hundreds of years earlier entering into the promised land. He'll cross over the Kidron Valley there and Kidron means black because it was stained with the dried blood of the sacrifices of those animals that were offered from the temple every morning, every evening, and throughout the day. And he'll understand at this moment that the blood of those animals that stain that place will soon flow with his own blood as he's redeeming mankind. And so as Jesus now is fixed, he is fixed toward this place and for this moment. All history written from Genesis to Revelation. You have from Genesis, the Old Testament, all the way to the end of the book of Malachi, looking forward to the cross. You have everything from there. All of the Gospels, all of the epistles, the book of Revelation, looking back at the cross. The cross is the pivotal point. And Jesus now is going to face that. Interesting things are going to happen about that. But he says this in verse 18, Behold. In other words, he's saying to his disciples, you need to take note of something here. Because I think especially as Luke gives us commentary that they didn't understand, I think that they thought that Jesus had come to fulfill what the Lion of Judah will eventually fulfill and that he will subdue all kingdoms under his authority and he'll rule and reign with a rod of iron. We're going to see that in a few moments because Salome, the mother of the sons of thunder, James and John, are going to come to Jesus and say, hey, when you come into your position of authority, can my sons, John and James, sit on either side of you? So they're thinking that he's come to subdue because they have missed the first coming as the Messiah, as the sacrificial lamb. And they're only seeing the second coming, coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah to rule and reign. And so Jesus has to give them more clear instruction. He says, behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the chief priests and unto the scribes and they shall condemn him to death. And he shall be delivered into the Gentiles' hand to be mocked and scourged. No doubt because that ability to take life, to execute capital punishment, had been taken away from the Jews by the Roman government. And so these chief priests, these scribes, these Sadducees, these Pharisees will deliver Jesus condemned to death into the hands of the Romans, into Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and ultimately crucified. But on the third day, he will rise again. We know this because of what Luke tells us in chapter 22, verse 22. Let's take a look at that. 
And truly the Son of Man goeth as it were determined. But woe to the man who betrays him. We find Peter writing about this event in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 through 24, and he says this, him speaking of Jesus, by the determined, um, by the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God was taken by wicked hands and was crucified and slain, whom hath God raised up, have loosed the pains of death because they were not possible that they should be holden upon him. In fact, Peter tells us again in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed by corruptible things, not by the works of the flesh, not by good deeds that you have done, not by any effort of your own, as we men have been studying Hebrews on Monday nights as we're going through the men's Bible study there, we found right there in chapter 1, He by Himself purged us of our sins. And then when we get to chapter 10, we find again that by one man's sacrifice, He has sanctified for, He has made holy forever those that are being sanctified. For as much as we know that we have not been redeemed by corruptible things like silver and gold, from our vain conversations received by the traditions of our fathers. It's not the law. It's not the keeping of the law. It's not the ceremonies. It's not the sacrifices. It's not the lambs. It's not the turtle doves. It's not the pigeons. It's not the bullocks. None of those things. They're all a shadow of Christ. And this is a pivotal moment because Christ now is setting His focus toward the cross where he will sacrifice himself for the sins of the world. He's leaving now his home for the last time, the area there of the Galilee. He'll see Capernaum no more in this form as he travels down the east side of the River Jordan. Soon we'll cross over Jericho, the brook Kidron, and will become the sacrificial lamb. Peter reminds us that we weren't redeemed by corruptible things, silver and gold, vain conversations received by the traditions of our fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. One psalmist hymn writer said, I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand because all other ground is sinking sand. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. And the relationship that we have, we have been brought back into by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb. And so he says, by the blood of Christ as the lamb without blemish, without spot, the perfect lamb, who verily was foreordained from the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you and for me. Listen, this thing, this event that Jesus has set his face now, as we're looking at here in, in, in chapter 20, toward Jerusalem, was predetermined before God ever created anything. Because God knows all things. He can't learn anything new. And he knew in eternity past, before he spoke the universe into existence, before he ever made any stars or any planets, before he ever put man upon this earth, that man was going to fail and man was going to have to be redeemed. And the only thing that could redeem him was the precious blood of the Son of God. And so he was crucified before the foundations of the world. And as he's looking now toward Jerusalem to fulfill his final destiny, it's very important for us to understand that even his disciples didn't understand. They still didn't understand. They still didn't get it. They still didn't comprehend that what was necessary for salvation wasn't a religious system. It wasn't a religious system of do's and don'ts and commandments and all of these things. What was necessary is that as by one man sin entered the world, by another man, the Christ man, sin could be taken from the world and that salvation would be of grace through the shed blood and faith in that shed blood of Jesus Christ, not by works of righteousness which we have done. All the way through the Bible we see this. 
We understood then that the Old Testament, all the things that happened in the Old Testament were only types and shadows of the real. That's why when we study through the Old Testament on Wednesday nights and we're coming through Deuteronomy now again for about the third or fourth time in this church, we understand there that what he's talking about is atonement. Kofar, where your sins are covered. But it's always looking forward to that moment when John pointed as the first New Testament prophet and the last Old Testament prophet, when he pointed to Jesus and said, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, this morning our sins aren't covered. We don't have atonement. That word kofar, atonement, we get almost as a direct transliteration into the English language, cover. Your sins were just covered. They were never removed until the cross of Christ. And after that, the Bible says by one act, by one sacrifice, this man has perfected forever those that are sanctified. And then we have that beautiful statement in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. And because of that, your sins and your iniquities, he will remember no more. This is amazing to me. Because God can do something that you and I cannot do. Well, there's a lot of things, but these two special things. Number one, God can forget as an act of His will. You want to talk about the sovereignty of God? I know there's a group in Christianity that love to talk about the sovereignty of God. The part of the sovereignty of God that I love is that as an act of His will, He can refuse to remember my sins and my iniquities forever because of the blood of His Son. That's why he can say to us, your sins, I will never record. Read Romans chapter 4. I will never impute sin to your account ever again. I refuse to see it. I refuse to acknowledge it. I refuse to record it. Because of what my son Jesus Christ has done, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. And so because he can do that, he has no struggle with forgiveness like you and I do. He has no problem seeing us through the blood of Jesus Christ as perfect. That's why he can see those things that are not as though they already were. And when, when God looks at you through the, the lens of his son, he sees you today perfect. Now that event hasn't happened yet, but Jesus now is focusing and setting his face like a flint. He's leaving that area of the Galilee for the last time. He's making that final journey down now to Jerusalem where he knows that just in a few days he's going to surrender his life. It's not going to be taken for the sins of the world. And we read in Matthew chapter 26 verses 38 through 40 what kind of goes on at that moment when he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Last Supper's already taken place. They've crossed over the Kidron. They're there in the Garden of Gethsemane. His disciples are with him. And we read there in Matthew 26, verse 38, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. You see, I just kind of want to remind you a few moments before we go through the rest of the text this morning that when Jesus spoke those words in verse 18 and verse 19, uh, there was emotion behind that. It wasn't easy for Jesus to do what he's about to do. He knows that the teaching ministry is now coming to an end. And he will be taken. First of all, he's going to be betrayed. Have you ever been betrayed? Any of you ever been betrayed by a friend? He says this while Judas Iscariot is in the company. I'm going to be betrayed. The Bible says we, we don't have a high priest that hasn't been touched with our infirmities. He knows what we go through. How many have been betrayed by a friend? Jesus is about to be betrayed by a friend. How many have suffered false accusation? He's about to be condemned. Here's the Holy One of Israel. Here's the only sinless man who's ever walked upon this earth after Adam. 
but he's about to be condemned through false accusation. He's about to endure an injustice. How many have been falsely accused? How many have had to endure an injustice? Well, Jesus is about to do that. Um, he's going to suffer deliberate insult. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be beaten, the Bible says, beyond recognition. He's going to have a crown of thorns placed upon his head. He's going to be scourged. All of that mockery by, and that shame that he's, and that insult. And listen, how many have been insulted? Jesus is going to bear it. Physical pain? Any of you gone through any physical pain? How many have gone through physical pain and you cry out to God, why do I have cancer? Why am I going through? Why this? Why that? Listen, he suffered. In fact, it says he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He's going to suffer a great humiliation. The creator of all things is going to be put to death, as it were, by his creation. Jesus is moving toward this moment, this pivotal moment. In fact, I would say the moment that we mark time by. When you write your date today, when you take your fathers to lunch, and you should, and you children, you pay for it, and you write that check for his prime rib or his ribeye steak today for lunch. When you write the check, and you put the date on that check. When you write that 2017, you are marking it has been that long according to the Roman Greco calendar. It has been that long since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We mark time by it. Because it is the most amazing event in human history. And Jesus now is marching toward that event. And in Matthew chapter 26, and we'll get there in a few weeks, it says this, Then he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye with me here for a while, and watch with me. I don't think Jesus was so much concerned about the physical. Now, he's going to be beaten. The word used in the Greek is the word we get pugilism from, boxing. He's going to be beaten to the extent that he's going to be so distorted through the bruising and the brokenness of his face with the, just the, the bruising there that he's not even going to look human. And a crown of thorns is going to be placed upon his head, driven in those large Judean hard thorns. And we have a crown right outside of the building. When you walk out of the sanctuary as you're going into the hallway before you get to the foyer, you'll see a crown of thorns there. That's going to be driven on his head. He's going to be scourged. In fact, historians of the day say he's going to be reduced to human rubble. His entrails will be showing as the flesh is going to be ripped away from his back and from his sides by a Roman soldier with a cat of nine tails, nine leather straps about 13 feet long, and all along the straps are sewn and, and, and attach pieces of bone and, and broken pottery at the end, lead balls, so that would wrap around you so that every stroke, every 39 of those stripes would rip the flesh literally from him. He'll be reduced to human rubble. He will be forced to carry a 200-pound cross till Golgotha, and there he will be nailed with huge spikes through the wrist and through the feet. Generally, you suffocated. It was the most agonizing death that you could ever imagine that has ever been created. And yet, I don't think that that's what he was agonizing over. I think it's the six hours he's going to spend separated from the Father. Because Habakkuk says that his eyes are too pure, God the Father's eyes are too pure to look upon sin. And he's going to turn his back upon his son the first time in eternity past, the only time in eternity future that the Father and Son, the first person and the second person of the Trinity will ever be separated. We're told at those moments and at that time that the bulls of Bashan, speaking of demon hordes, are going to encompass his feet and nip at him. And he's going to cry in agony, Eli, Eli, lama sobatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, he knows the answer. Because of your sin and mine. 
He will hang between heaven and earth, truly being the daysman, one who puts his hand on God and puts his hand on us, and he will bleed and die for the sins of the world having been reduced to human rubble, having been mocked and scourged, having had the people he came to save, the nation of Israel, turn him over to the Roman Empire to be crucified. To hear those words, crucify Jesus, but give us Barabbas. That's what's facing Jesus, and he knows it. As he makes his way now from the Galilee down to Jerusalem, and he's there in the garden, and he said, come pray with me, my soul is agonizing. And he says this as we move on in those verses, and he went a little further, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to go to the cross. If there's another way, the problem is there isn't another way. There never has been another way. There never will be another way. There's only one name given among heaven and earth where you must be saved, and it's the name of Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice. I love what Titus says, not by works of righteousness we have done, but because God is merciful, he saved you. Nevertheless, not as I will. I wish that we could say that every day of our lives, don't you? Bow your knee before the Father and say, I want to do something else, but nevertheless, not my will, but as thou wills, as you will. And he cometh to his disciples and he finds them asleep. You see, they don't get it, they don't understand. They don't know what lies in wait right after the triumphant entry we're going to read about next week. And he saith to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me for one hour? And so that's what's before us. And that's what he's trying to communicate to his disciples. And they don't get it. The reason why we know they don't get it, watch verse 20. Then came him, the mother, Salome. We know that Salome is the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is his aunt. James and John are his cousins, first cousins. It's interesting. And no doubt that's why she probably felt the freedom to come. And so the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, I guess they got him in tow, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. He knew that. And she said, and he said unto her, what wilt thou? You're here for a reason, not just to worship. You got your boys in tow. Uh, what is it? And she saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may set one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand when, he, when you come into your kingdom. Now, back in chapter 19, verse 28, he told them, because they were asking him, hey, what profit us to leave everything and follow you? He said, listen, in the resurrection, you're going to be seated on thrones. Salome is one of the women who traveled with the disciples. She no doubt was there and heard that. So now she comes and she says to Jesus, listen, you know, I remember just a chapter ago, the ink is not even dry on the pages when you said that, that these disciples are going to set on thrones and they're going to rule I Israel during the millennial reign. And so what I'm asking is, is that my two boys, James and John, good boys, let one sit on the right hand of you, let one sit on the left hand of you. I want them in a place of honor and prestige. And Jesus says in verse 22, you know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? And they said, yep. See, they don't get it. Yep, we're able. You see, the truth of the matter is we all have to be baptized with this baptism. Jesus said that no man can be my disciple unless he is willing to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's interesting when we look at the imagery of the Old Testament, I've shared with this with you many times, that when the Passover night came and they were to sacrifice the lamb, in the doorway because he's the door he's the way he's the truth he's the life that was imagery 
and to take the blood and put it upon the lentils and the doorpost. The lentil is the header and the doorpost are the two posts beside the door that hold up the header. The lentil and the doorpost which would have formed how many crosses? Jesus bore his cross for your salvation and for mine. But then he tells us all who come to me will have to bear their cross. Deny themselves and follow him. So he's asking a legitimate question. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism? I'm going to be baptized. And they said, we're able. Verse 23 says, and he saith to them, you shall drink indeed of my cup. And you shall be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on the right hand or upon the left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them from whom it is prepared of my Father. I'm not in a position to say, but my Father. And it's interesting that James was the first martyr. You can read in Acts chapter 12 that Herod had him put to death by the sword. And John was the last. John was, well, tried to be boiled in oil by Domitian. When they couldn't boil him in oil, they sent him to Patmos to be exiled. When he was finally re released from Patmos, he went to Ephesus. He was there with Polycarp, and he died the martyrdom of an old age. He had to outlive all of his friends and all of his disciples and die the martyrdom of an old age. But both of them drank of that cup. And then verse 24, watch this. Jesus uses his opportunity to teach. And when the ten, now there's division. The ten against the two. There's no longer twelve, there's ten against the two. And that's just how it goes sometimes in church when you're striving for position instead of for being a servant. There's always that. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him, and he said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles, they exercise dominion over them, and they are great uh, that exercise authority over them. You, you know how the world is. I mean, look at it. You can't only turn on Fox News without seeing this. You know, I want to raise my hand sometimes and say to the Republicans and the Democrats, listen, right wing, left wing, same bird. I want to say, hey, what about us out here in America? What about the nation? What about the well-being of the people? It's not about your two political parties. But they want to exercise great authority. And Jesus said the Sadducees and the Pharisees, just like that, want to exercise great authority. But he says this in verse 26, but it shall not be so among you. That's not how the church is to act. We don't strive to be the top. We don't strive to be the best or the leader or the most acknowledged. We should be striving to be the servant. And then he says this. Watch what he says. But it shall not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. That word is diakonos in the Greek. It means deacon. We have deacons in this church. You know what these deacons do? They take care of the physical needs of the body. They're your servants. They serve you. You say, well, that's not so bad. Uh, it's still a position. Uh, you get to be recognized as a deacon. You get to serve the body. At least, you know, you're in a place of leadership. Well, listen, he moves on in case you get that false concept and, and to verse, uh, into verse 27, and he says this, and whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be the servant. And that word there in the Greek is doulos, and it means the abject slave. You've given up all your rights, and not only are you serving the people, you're a slave to the people. You know, I found myself just recently thinking, man, Lord, when am I going to get a day off? Friday, I've only had one Friday off this month. That's my day off because of other things that have come along. Being down here, just helping out with the yard sale, and then with something else, and now, last Friday, spending it, over at our neighbor's house, Steve, who's dying of cancer. You know, sharing the gospel with him. He's a believer now. Been reading his Bible. He's got some things marked in it. Ministering to his family. Because you know what? I'm a slave. I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And then of you. I've had people say to me, I'd like to have your job. I said, Really? Oh, yeah, you only have to work two days a week, just Wednesday night and Sunday morning. Really? Are you serious? And I've challenged people who have said that, why don't you 
take a week off, take your vacation, and just hang with me for a week. But then you've got to come and spend every night at my house when the phone is ringing into all hours of the night. Listen, you've got to be with me when I'm, when I'm ministering to people in my office and when I'm preparing to study. To te- You get to hang with me the whole week. Then you'll find out. Because I don't have any rights. Jesus said, you want to be great in the kingdom? You want to be the chief? You must become the servant of all and the slave to everyone. And then he says this, and this is remarkable, because he still, listen to me, as we're closing out this chapter, he's still in the thought, in the context of him leaving his home, going to Jerusalem to sacrifice himself for the sins of the world. And then he says this, verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, and certainly he would have had every right to have been ministered to as God in human form, completely human with undiminished deity, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You've been sold into bondage, and he's going to ransom you out of that darkness and out of that bondage and out of that death, and he's going to deliver you into light and into truth and into eternal life and into blessing. That's what he came to do, and that's what he's about to do. And verse 29 says, And as they departed from Jericho, there came a multitude following them. We're going to find out later that this multitude that followed him, Lazarus was in the group. Can you imagine that? A guy that had been dead and raised. Simon the leper, who's not a leper anymore, will be in the group. In a few moments, we're going to read about blind Bartimaeus, and blind Bartimaeus will be in the group, and every other one that he had healed. There's a great multitude following him, down now from the area of the Galilee, following him, down through the regions there of the east side of the Jordan, and crossing over Jericho with him, and on into Jerusalem, toward the feast of the Passover, toward that moment when he will offer his life for the sins of the world. And verse 30 says, and we'll end in the next four verses, I find these the most interesting in this chapter. Because as I read this and have read it over and over and studied it, as I've looked at it in the original autographs and broken it out into the original language, you know what I find out more than anything that is interesting to me in in verse 30 and then 31, 32, 33, and 34? That I'm blind Bartimaeus. This is not talking about somebody that lived almost 2,000 years ago. Him and his buddy sitting alongside of the highway of life, blind, begging. As we read through the next few verses, can I offer for your consideration, that's you. You were blind Bartimaeus. That's me. I was blind Bartimaeus. One of the other gospels tells us that when he's healed, He took off his cape. That's the one he laid out for begging and he threw it away because he was no longer a beggar. You and I are blind Bartimaeus. And before Christ found you, before he passed by your way, as we're going to see in a few moments, before he heard your cry and stood still and asked you, what do you want from me? Before he opened your spiritual eyes, before you ever followed him, You were seated by the highway of life. You were a beggar and you were blind to spiritual things. You were dead and outside of the covenants and promises of God with no hope. You were just a beggar without sight, setting beside a road of life as everything else was passing you by. That's you. That's me. Would you say amen? That's us. And so we read here in verse 30, And behold, two blind men, Mark in his gospel, chapter 10, verse 46, tells us that one of these guys was Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus, or former blind Bartimaeus. And watch what it says here. It's so interesting how the Holy Spirit sets the pen and paper when, he, when the ink is not even, listen, not even dry on these pages, how it speaks to our hearts. Watch what he says here. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside. That's us. When they heard, because they couldn't see. You see, the first time the gospel comes to you and me, we can't see it. We have to hear it. 
Later our sight, our spiritual sight would be given to us, but we can only hear it first. We have to hear it. He says this, And they that were sitting by the wayside, when they had heard that Jesus passed by, they cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. They're expressing in, in the greatest way and in the greatest terminology, Jesus, we believe that you are the Christ, that you are the Messiah, that you're from the lineage of David, and one day you'll be seated on David's throne and you're going to rule with a rod of iron. We believe that you are the promised one. You are the anointed one. You are the Christ. You are Yeshua Mashiach. You listen, you are Emmanuel, God with us. We know who you are. We cry out to you. And the multitude rebuked them. Isn't it funny that when you first heard the gospel, how your friends tried to <laughs> be used of the enemy to help you resist giving your life to that? I, I remember right after I got saved, all my friends came and said, oh man, you're brainwashed. You're brainwashed. What happened to you? Are you kidding me? You got religion? I said, no, no, no. Uh, I got relationship. And listen, you're right. I was brainwashed. And my brains were dirty and filthy and they needed to be washed. But he didn't just wash my brains. He washed my heart. He washed my spirit. He washed my soul. I mean, remember the night you got saved or the morning or the afternoon. I still remember it. I remember it like it was yesterday, 42 years ago. I remember how blind I was. Sitting on a rainy October night in a parking lot crying out, no doubt, like blind Bartimaeus. Lord, if you're real, I can't do another day. If you're not real, life is not worth living. And before that night was over, my eyes would be opened. A beggar sitting by the wayside, blind. He hears that Jesus is passing by. He cries out, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. The multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried, the idea is all the more louder, they cried the more, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And Jesus stood still. Any time Jesus hears that cry, he stands still and he listens. And then it says, interesting enough, watch this, and he called them. He told us, go get those guys, bring them here. He called them. Are we not called with a holy calling and a heavenly calling? Did not God send the Holy Spirit to draw us into a relationship with His Son? He called them and said, what will you that I should do unto you? What is it that you need? What's your greatest need? I find it interesting they didn't say alms. They were there begging for alms. They didn't say alms. They said, we don't see. We need to see. Your greatest need when Jesus stood still at your cry wasn't anything physical, was it? Your spiritual eyes were blind. And you needed them to be healed that you might see. And they said, verse 33, unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. That our eyes may be opened. The Bible says that the carnal man understands not the things of God, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But you, and the idea is whose eyes have been opened, you understand all things because the Spirit bears witness with your spirit concerning the things of God. The greatest need of man is that the spiritual eyes would be opened again because at the fall in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord and they died spiritually, those eyes shut. And our greatest need is that those eyes would be opened again. And they said, Jesus, 
that our eyes, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Watch verse 34. So Jesus had compassion. My Bible says, all who come to him, he'll turn none away. He has compassion on everyone. I've had people tell me when I've presented the gospel to them, well, you don't understand what I've done. I don't care. It doesn't matter. But you don't know what I've done. I said, I don't need to know what you've done. I know that the grace of God is sufficient and the blood of Christ is enough. So I don't care where you slept or who you slept with. I don't care if you've committed murder. I don't care what you've guzzled down your throat or injected in your arm or inhaled into your lungs or snorted up your nose. It doesn't matter. I don't care how many times you've been divorced. I don't care if you've been to prison. It doesn't matter. What do you mean it doesn't matter? What matters is, is that you're blind and what you need is that your eyes should be open and Jesus, if you will cry unto him, will stand still. He will call you until you come to him. He will ask you, what is your greatest need? And if you get the answer right, Lord, I need to see. I'm blind. Tell me what life is about. Tell me how to get to eternity safely. What, what's going on? He will always answer. We're blind. Our eyes need to see. Jesus had compassion on them, and he touched their eyes. Forty-two years ago, God not only touched my eyes, he touched my heart, touched my mind. You see, you don't really see with your eyes. Did you know that? In fact, there's been a recent case where they've discovered some techniques for some people that have certain kind of diseases that have been blind that they can restore their sight. And it's amazing when they have conversation for the first time with these people, when the wraps are taken off and they can see, they have a very difficult time because they can see imagery, they can see light and all of that, but their brain has not, it is not used to processing that because you don't see with your eyes, you see with your mind. Your eyes only take in information that your mind has to process. And if you don't think that's true, close your eyes and you can still see things. Right? You see with your mind. And Jesus is going to change their mind. He's going to change their heart. He's going to change their worldview. He's going to change their eternity. He's going to change their spirit. He's going to change their soul. He's going to change everything when he touches them. My whole world was rocked 42 years ago in a little Bible study in the mountains when Jesus touched my eyes because it affected my mind, it affected my heart, it affected my soul, it affected my spirit. It ruined me forever for this world and it started the process of preparing me for eternity. He wrote my name in the book of life. He put his spirit inside of me. I was born again. Jesus had compassion and he always does on everyone who will cry from a sincere heart, Thou son of David, have mercy. And he touches his eyes both of their eyes. We know one of these guys is blind Bartimaeus. And three weeks later, does it say that? After much penance and works, after joining the church and being baptized in water, <laughs> becoming a full member. Is that what it says? That's what religion does. When Jesus touches somebody, what he does for them is immediate. Immediately. Their eyes received sight. And notice the response to that. And they followed him. You're here this morning because God has touched you. When you cried out, have mercy on me, thou son of David, God stopped and he listened. He called you through the Spirit. He saved you through his Son. And when he touched you, he gave you your sight. He healed your heart. He changed your destiny. Everything changes at that moment. So as we end up finishing chapter 20 this morning, very interesting, because the teaching ministry of Jesus now is turning and Jesus sets his face like a flint toward Jerusalem for the last time. He's going to make that journey from the Galilee down. He knows that when he crosses over the Jordan and enters into the first time the area of Judea, when he has the Last Supper and crosses over the Kidron Brook and there is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he will be arrested. 
He will be falsely accused and falsely tried. He will be beaten and scourged and mocked and ultimately crucified. But on the third day, he's going to raise again. And he's going to do that for the sins of the world, for you and me. He tries to explain it to his disciples. They don't get it. They're still arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And maybe are still arguing as he's going down the road on the way into Jerusalem when he passes by blind, blind Bartimaeus. Blind, blind Bartimaeus had heard that Jesus was coming. And no doubt when he heard, because when you're blind, your ears are far more sensitive to things going on. When he had heard the crowd approaching, he began to cry, Have mercy on me, thou son of David. And when the cry crowd tried to squelch it, he cried even the louder, have mercy on me, thou son of David, Messiah, King of glory, Savior of the world, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, bring that man to me. What is it that you want? I'm blind. I don't need a physical, I need a spirit, I'm blind. Jesus had compassion and touched him. You see, Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious system, would have never touched him. They thought it was the curse of God, the finger of God, that he was blind. That he had done something so awful that God had caused. You can read it in the scriptures. Who sinned? His father and mother, this man be born blind. They thought it was a result of sin and they wouldn't have touched him. But Jesus touched him and said, receive your sight. From that moment forward, he followed Jesus. I think it's incredible that the first thing he saw was Jesus. Can you imagine people saying, hey, have you seen this mountain? Oh, yeah, that's okay. Have you seen these rivers? Oh, yeah, that, those are fine too. I mean, what is worth seeing after you've seen Jesus? Can you imagine when his eyes are open, Jesus is there with his hands on his face, smiling at him? Maybe even took him by the face and said, hey, man, you can see. And a few days later, he's going to see the one who healed him crucified. He's going to see that. But a few days after that, he's going to see him risen from the dead. He's going to see that. And he will follow him the days of his life. Amen. What a beautiful story as now the tide is turning. The ministry is shifting. Jesus is no longer in the teaching mode. He's in the sacrificial mode. And he makes his way down now to Jerusalem. Hey, read ahead. We'll be in chapter 21 next Sunday. Amen? Hey, let's stand if you can because we're going to have the ushers come and the worship team as well. We're going to uh, distribute the cup and the bread. We're going to honor our Father this morning for sending his Son through taking communion. Amen? And don't forget, man, honor your fathers today. These men have worked hard for you. Amen? Now put a roof over your head and food in your belly and clothes on your back. Uh, they've battled the elements and, you know, and done great things. Amen? Some of them are new at it and some of them are old at it. and Some are right in the middle of it. Some of them are fathers, some of them are grandfathers and great-grandfathers. It's amazing. Amen? You know, Frank, you don't look like a great-grandfather. Since you're the only guy standing, I didn't dare ask if you're a great, great, great grandfather, but I don't know if that would be possible or not. But listen, my prayer for this church, it's the same prayer every Sunday morning, that God would open your spiritual eyes that you would see and understand what it is that Jesus Christ did for you. That he would so fill you with the Holy Spirit that you would be so grateful and so appreciative that grace would never be taken for granted that you would stand in awe all the days of your life of what Jesus Christ did for us. And out of that attitude, you would worship Him. Amen? And now we're going to get a chance to, because, again, He tells us to remember some things when we come to the communion table. We want to remember the love of the Father that He would send the Son. God loves you. We also want to remember that this sacrifice cleansed you of your sins. You're forgiven. And the third thing we want to remember is that we have unity or communion with the Father, 
and with one another as we eat from this common loaf. So there's unity. Amen? That's what this represents. So we're going to worship. The uh, ushers are going to distribute the cup and the bread. You hold it, and in a few moments, we'll, we'll eat and drink together. Okay? Father, we thank you so much for this table, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless the broken body, the bread that represents the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So, Lord, as it's being distributed, as we sit quietly in worship now, Father, you... Uh, May that just soak in and sink into our hearts this morning. And may we be filled with gratitude. May it be a time of self-examination that we wouldn't eat or drink in an unworthy manner. We wouldn't eat and drink with unrepentant sin in our lives. So we should examine ourselves, as Paul tells us, that we don't eat in an unworthy manner. So as we're worshiping, as the cup and the bread are being distributed, Lord, may your Holy Spirit just search out our hearts. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, you endured my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame. Oh, because of you. the universe broken for the sins of the earth all because of your love all because of your love because of your cross because of your cross my dead is paid because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life, I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love, I live. Holy King Died to set the captives free All because of your love Lord, you gave your life for me So I will live my life for you All because of your love Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life, I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love, I live. Victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life, I freely give. Because of your love, because of your 
morning to know that you're clean and forgiven. You are, oh man, I don't feel like that, Pastor. Well, you are. You are, Debbie. You are, Randy. Frank, even in your old age, brother, you are forgiven and clean. That goes for you too, Carl. To know this morning, apart from anything we've ever done, Jerry, apart from anything you've ever done, in fact, in spite of the things you have done, God forgives you. Chuck, you're forgiven. Patty, you're forgiven. Why? Because you kept some moral standard or belonged to some religious system? No. We're not here because of that. I've had people ask me, how do you join the church? You can't. You mean there's no church membership? Oh, no, there's a membership. There's a role, but only God keeps it. You must be born again. And if you're a born again believer, you're part of the family of God. That means you're part of this church because there's only one church and it's universal. It's the blood-bought saints of Jesus Christ. Oh, well, some of our family believe some pretty weird things. But as long as they got the gospel down right, as long as they believe that Jesus was God's only son, the second person of the Trinity, come in human form, that he lived a sinless life as he was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin, died a substitutionary death, rose again the third day, and salvation is of grace through faith. They're part of the family. It doesn't matter beyond that what they think. They can be absolutely wrong. We can be wrong. But you can't be wrong on that. Amen? And we're not wrong on that here. Because we believe that Jesus by himself purged our sins. By His stripes we are healed. Through the shedding of His blood we are forgiven. Would you say amen? And here's the beauty of it. Turn to your neighbor. I get marriage counseling all in the same time. Turn to the person next to you. Tell them you're forgiven. On the other side. This really saves me a lot of marriage counseling. I'm telling you right now. Because when husbands have to tell their wives and wives have to tell their wives like Max and Georgia, they never have to come in the office because we do this kind of a thing. Amen? Hey, the reality of it is this morning, if you accept the Christ, you can struggle with sanctification, but you are justified through faith. Having been, it's in the past tense, you're declared clean, perfect, whole by one sacrifice. Amen. Father, this morning as we eat and drink, from this table, we are recognizing, we are realizing again, we are acknowledging, and Lord, we are thanking you from grateful hearts that your sacrifice and your shed blood has forgiven us of our sins. It's a text proof that you love us and that, Lord, we have fellowship with you and you with us and us with one another because of this table that we're about to, about to partake of. So, Lord, bless the bread, bless the cup as we eat and drink together this morning. In Jesus' name, let's do that. Mm, thank you, Father. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Let's turn this side of the church to that side. You know how it goes. That side to this side. Why still? Am I on? Okay. Why well, still trying to digest your cracker? Here we go. So. Okay. Um, so you can still sing like me. Amen. And here's the deal: we want to bless this sign. We want to bless that sign. Listen, you're about to go out into a world that's hostile toward you as Christians. Did you know that? They're going to say all manner of evil about you. But here in this place, we want you to know that the grace of the Lord is upon you and God loves you. Amen. So we want to pronounce that blessing on each other before we leave. 
right? It's scriptural. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul is doing this to the church at Corinth, and now we're doing it to each other almost 2,000 years later. So you know the drill. Let's do it. Now you can turn the mic off. done what you told us to do in the Old Testament. The priests were to give there in Deuteronomy chapter 6 the blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. And the New Testament is may the grace of our Lord be with you and the love of our Lord and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. And Lord, I pray this blessing upon this congregation. How beautiful it was this morning to read again and to hear again as Jesus turns his face now toward the cross as he makes that long journey from the area of the Galilee to Jerusalem. As he reminds his disciples of what he must do, they don't get it. Blind Bartimaeus does. Lord, we thank you that we have. Thank you for opening our eyes, for putting your spirit in us, for by grace and through your mercy and of faith saving us. We thank you for all of those things. Now, Lord, bless this congregation as they make their way home, as they honor their fathers for the rest of the day, as many of them take their fathers to dinner or preparing dinner at home. Pray for those of our congregation that are traveling away today with their families. Bless them. And Lord, we just thank you for this wonderful day. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Hey, you are free to go. Be blessed. If you need prayer, we'll be right up here in the front to pray with you and for you.